For more than half a century, Hollywood Park, a California showplace, has provided the colorful background for absolutely top-class thoroughbred racing. The aptly called Track of the Lakes and Flowers, located just a few furlongs from the cooling Pacific, was a great success with the public from the very beginning. It soon became a regular summer home for the best horses and jockeys in the land. During the late 1940s, the track survived a disastrous fire that left a twisted ruin of the once glamorous facade and stands. Fortunately, no horses were lost. Stables, riders, and most of the patrons moved across town to Arcadia for the summer racing season. A fall meet was added when the plant was rebuilt. Hollywood Park, renewed to more than its former glory, recovered and led the nation in attendance and mutual handle through much of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Famous thoroughbreds and talented horsemen were on display from the onset, and an exceptional number of these have since been voted into the National Hall of Fame. On June 10, 1938, the place to be in Southern California was Inglewood for the opening of the new racetrack. It fast became Hollywood's favorite playground. The stars came to see and be seen, and the racing public was enthralled. The first meeting was so successful that a new $50,000 race was added to the schedule, the Hollywood Gold Cup. Perhaps Eddie Cantor's eyes popped more than usual because he spotted the great sea biscuit driving between Specify and Which Sea to win going away. Of course, Seabiscuit became a member of the Hall of Fame, as did his jockey, George Wolfe. Eddie Arcaro, who was elected in 1958, had often made his presence felt at Hollywood Park. He rode Count of Honor for Robert Lehman in the 1956 Hollywood Derby in a typical performance by the man the jockeys called the master. Aboard a horse crying to go, Arcaro decided to let Count of Honor run early rather than fight him. Triple Crown winner and Horse of the Year Count Fleet was much best this day, but our Caro, as always in a big race, took no chances. He was urging his mount on even while drawing away. The time of 1.59 and 2 fifths was then the fastest on record for a three year old. In 1938, John Longdon was also voted into the Hall of Fame. Longdon changed the riding style of Western racing with his ability to send horses smartly from the starting gate to save ground along the rail and to have enough left at the finish. In the 40 years between 1927 and 1966, no one wanted to win races more than John Longdon, and no one did. In 1954, Hollywood Park inaugurated a new handicap for older horses, the Californian. Longdon's mount, Imbros, was a natural speed horse, and his stablemate, Determin, had just won the Kentucky Derby. Hall of Fame trainer William Moulter saddled that strong Andrew Crevelin entry, and Ray York rode Determin. In a typical Longdon ride, Imbros was sent to the front and stayed there wire to wire, equaling the world record for the mile and a sixteenth. Determined made a late run, but settled for second. It was an auspicious beginning for what was to become a race of national import. The danger of sending a horse fast from the gate is a disastrous speed duel. That's what happened in the 1957 Starlet. There were three undefeated Colts in this championship race, and two of them, Fleet Nasrula with Longdon and Strong Ruler under Mel Peterson, set a torrid pace. As Strong Ruler made his move, he veered in from right-handed whipping, taking the path of Fleet Nasrula and causing Longdon to take up sharply. 
Although Old Pueblo under Arquero was closing resolutely, he ran out of racetrack. Hollywood Park was the first track to film races from various angles for use of track stewards. Within seven minutes, the 16 millimeter film was processed and ready to view by stop action projection. A nearby patrol judge reported that the horse's hooves clicked together at this point. The potentially dangerous action by Strong Ruler and his rider resulted in disqualification, being placed behind the horse he fouled. The disqualification made Old Pueblo and Arquero winners, even though they had not been impeded. Three years later, Longdon rode a strikingly mature fleet Nasrula in the California. Again, on the lead in the Longdon style, Fleet Nasrula propped slightly when he saw the starting gate, but recovered. This was the third win for Longdon and the Californian, each wire to wire. Purchased earlier by Elwood Johnston for $150,000 from John Hertz, Fleet Nasrula proved to be a great bargain as both a racehorse and a stallion. Riders said that Longdon was hard to catch and very hard to pass when he was caught. In a stake which featured the famous stretch runner Silky Sullivan, Longdon again demonstrated his will to win. While Silky Sullivan's charge faltered, John, on the rail and on the lead with gold cover from the start, lost that advantage to 21 guns and George Taniguchi near the 16th pole. But all was not lost for Grandpa John. Win number 4,000 on the way to a total of 6,032 was a John D. Hertz filly fleet diver who later became the dam of native diver. John Longdon led the jockey list in 1938, 1947, and 48. The Racing Hall of Fame has three categories, horses, jockeys, and trainers. From the beginning, Hollywood Park attracted many of the best of each. Opening year, 1938, saw Kentucky Derby winner Lauren win two stakes here for trainer B.A. Jones. Ben Jones was a college graduate and leading breeder before he trained for Calumet Farm. His son, Horace A. Jones, always called Jimmy, assisted, then replaced his father as head of the most powerful stable of the era. Calumet's grand filly, A Gleam, was the undefeated winner of five stakes at Hollywood in 1952, beating the males three times. Apparently, they could lead her to water, but couldn't make her drink. The masterpiece for the Jones boys was the 1948 Triple Crown winner and Horse of the Year, Citation. Brought to Hollywood Park in 1951, Big Cy created a sensation. Thought by many experts to be the greatest thoroughbred of all time, Citation had won the century and the American handicaps before this appearance for the Gold Cup. On July 14, 1951, Citation under Steve Brooks won his Gold Cup by four lengths. It made him the first thoroughbred to have won more than a million dollars in purses. Then Jones was elected to the Hall of Fame in 1958 with Citation and Jimmy Jones following in 1959. He was a shining hero and looked the part. They asked him to parade a week later, but the crowd noise or being on the muscle made him edgy. He aimed a wicked kick at Jimmy, but H.A. proved quicker on two feet and Citation on four. There is no Hall of Fame for owners, even though they pay the bills. Movie moguls such as Harry Warner were great supporters of racing and often appeared to be in command. But horsemen such as Hall of Fame trainer Buddy Hirsch knew better. Nonetheless, Louis B. Mayer, head of MGM, seemed to be telling him they start over there and end here. With star owners such as Betty Grable and Harry James, it all made for a very glamorous scene. Alfred Vanderbilt was a star, but of a different sort. 
His Hall of Fame trainer, Bill Winfrey, recalled a Vanderbilt expression that whoever rode for him would end up in diamonds. Hall of Fame jockey Eric Guerin was dressed in those cerise and white diamonds when he won the 1955 Sunset Handicap on Social Outcast for Vanderbilt. His grand gelding, Find here between horses, honored those silks by winning the 1957 American and Sunset Handicaps at age seven for Vanderbilt and trainer Winfrey. Robert Kleberg, owner of the King Ranch in Texas, also favored distinctive silks. He used the brand of the ranch, not on the horses, such as 1955 Gold Cup winner Rejected, but on the jockeys. A racetrack cliche proclaims that good horses make good trainers, and it is no exaggeration to say that swaps put M.A. Tenney into the Hall of Fame, but Mesh was a successful trainer before and after swaps. He saddled his first winner at age 21 and was still winning stakes 60 years later. Tenney was practically born in the saddle and regularly helped school young horses. Thoroughbreds, owned by Rex Ellsworth and trained by Mesh Tenney, led the racing world in purse money won in 1962 and 63. In a stable area interview, Tenney told why they liked Hollywood Park. Well, we always race at Hollywood Park if you want the truth, Bill, because the money here is better. We wouldn't want him to move in on us, would we? Well, not right now, I don't <laughs> think. Go ahead, Mitch. Uh, secondly, the weather here is better than it is anywhere I've been uh, in racing. But, of course, the primary reason is the high purses they pay at Hollywood Park. Tenney and his wife were aboard Swap's private car when he arrived home in Inglewood after winning the 1955 Kentucky Derby. Mesh had amused the press by sleeping in the horse's stall at Churchill Downs to prevent any possible tampering with his colt. Perhaps he knew that Swaps was one in a lifetime. Certainly the Hollywood Park fans responded to the brilliant chestnut when he merely paraded in front of the stands, the faithful lined the rails. Even the presiding stewards turned out this day. When swaps actually raced, an extra 5,000 admissions could be counted. The second running of the Californian featured three-year-old swaps breezing away from older horses while still under restraint. As in 1954, Determine was second. The board reflected a new world's record. Mesh Tenney had substituted jockey Dave Erb for Bill Shoemaker, suspended for a minor racing infraction, but for the remainder of Swap's racing career, he and Shoemaker were never again separated. In 1956, they rewrote the record books, commencing with a new world mark in the one-mile Argonaut handicap on June 9th. By July 14th, when the horses broke from the gate in the Gold Cup, Swaps had set two more world speed records at Hollywood Park and was still so eager to run that he almost pulled Shoemaker out of the saddle first time past the stand. Swaps carried 130 pounds this day, giving 15 to Mr. Gus and 11 pounds to Porterhouse. If horses are respected for their speed and the ability to carry weight over a distance, Swaps had it all. He carried 130 on six occasions and won. Swaps retired holding the largest collection of speed records in history, from one mile to a mile and five eighths, usually with Shoemaker looking back and easing the chestnut. He was voted 1956 Horse of the Year and elected to the Hall of Fame in 1966. To commemorate the most honored California bred horse ever, artist Albert Stewart was commissioned to create a dynamic bronze of swaps in full stride with Shoemaker Up. Sketches led to a clay model and then a casting more ambitious than any attempted before on the West Coast. One-eighth larger than life-sized, 
the bronze was an honorable attempt to capture the spirit of one of the most generous and graceful of horses. Dedicated on July 1st, 1958, the Swap statue is as much a part of Hollywood Park as the memory of his greatness. He was retired to stud, but no horse he produced was as good as he. How could it have been? Round Table, owned by Travis Kerr, was a picture of equine balance and was good enough to be voted Horse of the Year in 1958. He entered the Hall of Fame in 1972. When trainer William Moulter entered Round Table in the 1957 Gold Cup, he was a three-year-old facing seasoned, older handicapped stars. Under Bill Shoemaker, who could make the assigned weight of 109 pounds, Round Table went to the post and into history. On the inside, Terang is third. By a head on the outside, Find is fourth. By a neck, between horses, Rumbo is next. By a length and a half, then comes Eddie Schmidt, Gigantic, Hoop Band, Porterhouse, Brooksickle, and Phoebe Carlitos. Passing the half mile post, it is Round Table on the outside, showing in front by a head. El Cobar is second by two. Harang is third by a head, and now Find is making his move on the outside, and Porterhouse is closing ground, and now, at the top of the turn, it's Round Table drawing out. By two lengths, Find is second by a length and a half, El Cobar, and Porterhouse. Here comes Porterhouse on the outside. Turning for home, it's Round Table by a length and a quarter. Find is second by a length and a half. Porterhouse is third by five lengths, and now Gigantic has moved into fourth position. But in the stretch, it's Round Table running away with the race. He's going on a five, five lengths. Porterhouse is second. Find is third. It's Round Table in front and down to the wire. It is Round Table winning it by three lengths. Porterhouse second. The first three year old to win the classic Hollywood Gold Cup. From the same crop as Round Table and Bold Ruler, Gallant Man has been called the best horse never to win a national championship. He made the Hall of Fame anyhow in 1987. For the 1958 Gold Cup, Hall of Fame trainer John Nerud shipped Gallant Man west for owner Ralph Lowe. He carried 130 pounds. Swirling Abbey is second by a neck. On the rail, Eddie Schmidt saving ground is third by three quarters. Sean Enos fourth by a length and a half. And a Gallant Man. Into the back stretch. It is still Mystic Eye by a half a length, but now Swirling Abbey is moving up, and here comes Shawneen in a contention on the outside with Eddie Schmidt fourth, and Gallant Man is beginning to move. They're nearing the half-mile post with Mystic Eye and Swirling Abbey head and head, and uh, now it is Mystic Eye showing by a head, Swirling Abbey second by a head, Shawneen is third, and Gallant Man has moved up to fourth on the outside. At the top of the far turn, Swirling Abbey has the lead by a head with Shawneen right behind him on the outside to be second by a length. Mystic Eye is next to Gallant Man, and now Eddie Schmidt is beginning to come on between horses. They're passing the quarter pole, and Shawneen has it by a head. Swirling Abbey is second by a half a length. On the outside, Gallant Man is third by a half a length. Eddie Schmidt is next, and now Mystic Eye is last. In the stretch, it's Shawneen and Gallant Man challenging on the outside. And now it is Gallant Man in front. It's Gallant Man by a half a length, by three quarters. And here comes Eddie Schmidt on the inside, but it's Gallant Man in front. And under the wire, Gallant Man has it by a half a length. Eddie Schmidt second by a length and a half. Shawneen third by a length and a half. The third consecutive Gold Cup win for Bill Shoemaker. Shoemaker was also the rider of the youngest Hollywood Park champion in 1958, two-year-old English-bred Tommy Lee. Breaking from the number six stall, Tommy Lee was away badly, allowed to settle a bit, then displayed the kind of sudden and sustained move that is the mark of a good horse. Second jungle dancer is third, Palm Beach is fourth, Monk's Hood is fifth. Tommy Lee is next, then comes Butcher Boy, Nazareth Sweep, and Old Fools. Passing the half-mile post, 
It is Finnegan by three quarters of a length. F.H. Russ is second to buy ahead on the rail. Palm Beach is third. And uh, there goes Tommy Lee moving fast on the outside. At the top of the turn, it's Finnegan by a length. Tommy Lee is second by two and a half. Palm Beach is third by a head. F.H. Russ is next. Then comes Monk's Hood, Jungle Dancer, Butcher Boy, Old Fools, and Nazrula Sweep. Turning for home, it is Tommy Lee on the outside by a head. Finnegan is second by six lengths. Monk's Hood is third and Jungle Dancer. In the stretch, it's Tommy Lee and Finnegan. It's Tommy Lee and Finnegan with Tommy Lee in front. They're coming down to the wire, Tommy Lee and Finnegan. And Tommy Lee is winning and drawing away. One year later, Hall of Fame trainer Frank Childs had Tommy Lee ready for the race of his life. Bill Shoemaker rode perhaps the race of his life, too, in the 1959 Kentucky Derby. Pinned down on the rail and headed by Sword Dancer and Bill Boland, Shoemaker called on some powerful inner resource of horse and man to bring Tommy Lee on again. The C.V. Whitney filly, Silver Spoon, a troubled fifth in the Derby, was shipped back to Hollywood Park hoping for a rematch. Five weeks after the Kentucky Derby, she met Tommy Lee again, this time in the mile and one-eighth cinema handicap. Second, third, on the rail by a neck. Old Foles is fourth, racing on the extreme outside. Silver Spoon is fifth, moving up strongly between horses. Prince Cohen, Civic Pride, and King of Turf. Now it's Friar Roach in front by a three length. Silver Spoon is second on the inside by a half length. Old Foles third by a head. Tony Lee. In a game of musical jockeys, Shoemaker was in New York winning the Belmont Stakes on Sword Dancer. Bill Boland rode Silver Spoon here, and Donald Pierce drew the mount on Tommy Lee, who ran so badly that he was taken out of training for six months by his irate owner, Fred Turner. Silver Spoon had suffered a youthful hip injury, which may have caused a rather high-headed way of going, but her class was unwavering. Carrying 120 pounds, Silver Spoon had given 9 pounds to the runner-up and 15 to the third-place Colt. The following year, she achieved the unique distinction of becoming the first female in the long and illustrious history of the vanity handicap to win with 130 pounds assigned. John Longdon rode. And Queen America on the rail, Silver Spoon in front by one length. Silver Spoon was voted into the Hall of Fame in 1978. Her trainer was Bob Wheeler, and she was saluted this victorious afternoon by Walt Disney. Perhaps because of close ties to the motion picture colony, Hollywood Park was very public relations oriented from the start. A regular stable tour introduced many to the early morning world of horse racing. Tours entertained groups of young people. Workout information, which had often been suppressed, was organized. As they entered the track, horses were identified to clockers and to the public at Railbird Corner. Gradually, the barriers between horsemen and fans were eased and lifelong patrons developed. No horse earned more fan appreciation than Native Diver, that bundle of nervous energy waiting to explode. Reminiscent of the horse painters depicted years ago, even his morning gallops were adventures. Many major races were then telecast live to 19 cities, and the Diver became a media celebrity. Bred and owned by L.K. Shapiro, the affectionately nicknamed Black Horse responded to all the attention by winning 37 races, 34 of them stakes. Seldom touched by his rider's whip, the diver, for all his racing life, ran as fast as he could for as far as he could.
The smart information on Native Diver was that he stopped if another horse ran head and head with him early. In the 1965 Los Angeles Handicap, jockey Ken Church tried that tactic with the superior sprinter Viking Spirit and was confident of winning right up to the moment jockey Jerry Lambert shifted to another gear. The time for the seven furlongs established a new world's record. Native Diver followed up by winning the Gold Cup and then repeated that signal victory in 1966, the first horse to win this great prize twice. His trainer, Buster Millerick, was rough around the edges, but one of the most respected horsemen in the West. In 1967, the Gold Cup drew a short field of five. Now eight years old, Native Diver faced a genuinely good horse pretense. The start added another dimension of danger in the contest. That's Milo Valenzuela leaving the stumbling O'Hara. It's worth another look. There they go. O'Hara lost the rider. Native Diver is going to the front. Pretense is second. Biggs third on the inside. And Quicken three. Coming by the stands the first time, it's Native Diver in front by two and a half lengths. Pretense is second by two lengths. Biggs third and Quicken Tree trails. O'Hara, the loose horse, the riderless horse is moving up to third. Turning for home, it's Native Diver in front by two lengths. Pretense is second by eight lengths. Biggs is third and Quicken Tree. The loose horse is on the outside of Pretense turning into the stretch. It's Native Diver in front on the inside by three quarters of a length. Three tenths is second by four lengths. Biggs third and quick and three trails. Native Diver in front. Three tenths second. Biggs and quick and three. Native Diver in front. Three tenths and Biggs. Native Diver drawing out again. Native Diver three tenths and Biggs. And Native Diver is the winner by four lengths. Three tenths second. Biggs was third. To commemorate his three consecutive Gold Cup victories, a unique ceramic tile monument was created by artist Millard Sheets. The first California bred horse to win more than a million dollars, Native Diver was elected to the Hall of Fame in 1978. Unexpectedly early death due to illness added poignancy to the dedication of the 20-foot long memorial, which also marks his burial place. Stories of the speed of the black horse are now part of that special mystique reserved for beloved athletes. the only third generation horseman in the Hall of Fame, having followed grandfather William and father Preston Birch. Between 1968 and 1972, Elliot and his grass champion Fort Marcy logged many frequent flyer miles between east and west coast. Fort Marcy, bred and raced by Paul Mellon, was grass champion of 1967 and to be horse of the year in 1970. <laughs> Trial and error proved that Fort Marcy ran best if he shipped as close to the race as possible. This trip was on Saturday for the 1968 Sunset Handicap run on Monday, July 22nd. Fifteen grass specialists were entered for the final stakes of the meeting. Lafitte Pinkai was assigned the mount on Fort Marcy. So many were entered that one horse started outside the 14 stalled gate. The description by Harry Henson was a lesson in the art of race calling. Skookum is going to the front, Pink Pigeon is second deck hand, third, Fort Marcy is for society, fifth, then Rivet, Saint Tech, Zulu Lad, Main Sheet, Fiddle Isle, Princess Nation, Quicken Tree, Jungle Road, and Road Hug. 
coming by the stands the first time, Ed Skookum in front by a half length, Pink Pigeon is second by three lengths, Deckhand third by a head, Society fourth on the outside by five lengths, Fort Marcy is fifth, then Main Sheet, Rivet, Fiddle, Isle, St. Tex, Gazella, Princess Nesian, Brick and Tree, Zulu Lad, Road Hog, and Jungle Road. Around the far turn, it's still Skookum in front by uh, two lengths, Pink Pigeon is second by a head, Deckhand third, and there goes Fort Marcy moving up on the outside, and Quick and Tree between Horses and Rivet turning into the stretch. It's Fort Marcy in front, drawing out by two lengths, Quick and Tree is second by one length, Fiddle Isle third, moving up on the outside, Rivet is fourth, and Princess Nesian, Fort Marcy in front on the inside, Quick and Tree is second, Fiddle Isle and Rivet, it's a driving finish. Fort Marcy on the inside and Quick and Tree. Fort Marcy, Quick and Tree and Fiddle Isle. And Fort Marcy is the winner by a nose. Quick and Tree second. In his first season at Hollywood Park, Lafitte Pinkai Jr. led the jockeys with 92 wins. Perhaps no athlete has ever exercised the self-control demanded of Pinkai for more than 25 years, for he must maintain his weight at 115 pounds on a frame designed for 145. 1968 was a banner year for Lafitte. On April 27th, he put his name in the record book. W.R. Hans Polax was his mount in the Will Rogers handicap that day, and Pinkai already had five winners. Only Shoemaker had won six in a single day at Hollywood Park. Third by a hit, D1, fourth by one leg, and there goes Polax, moving up very strongly on the outside, and Chris on the rail, turning into the stretch. It's right or wrong, in front by a neck, Glory Hallelujah is second by one leg. Here comes Polax on the outside and now taking the lead. It's Polax in front, drawing out by two lengths. Glory Hallelujah second by a head, right or wrong, ND1. Polax in front, right or wrong, Glory Hallelujah, ND1. Polax and right or wrong coming on again. And Polax is the winner by a head, right or wrong, second by two and a half. Certainly one of the strongest finishers in the sport, Pinkai's power lies not in the whip, but in balance and timing. Even when his mount makes an unexpected move, his horsemanship prevents an accident and even preserves the win. The William Hagen Perry stable owned 1967 and 1968, winning the money title both years with its great filly and mare lineup. Hall of Fame trainer Jim Maloney brought back the days of Louis B. Mayer and Calumet by running one, two, three in major stakes races. The 1968 Vanity Handicap was a case in point. Led by that marvelous Hall of Fame mayor, Gainley, the entry went off at odds of 30 cents on the dollar, and that was a bargain. Nevada Marga is going to the front. Uh, America's fancy is... Gainley, Gainley was assigned 131 pounds weight no mayor had ever carried successfully in California. Princess Nesian and courageously going into the first turn, it's Gamely in front by a length and a half, Nevada Marga is second by a length and a half, Desert Law third on the inside by a head for giving fourth by two and a half lengths, Lucky Spot is fifth, Amerigo's Fancy sixth, Princess Nesian seventh and courageous turning into the stretch, it's Gamely in front by a length and a half, Desert Law is second by three quarters of a length, and here comes Princess Nesian on the outside. Hall of Fame trainers Bill Moulter and Jimmy Jones had done it before, and Charlie Whittingham would do it later. So Jim Maloney joined an exclusive club this afternoon in 1968. And courageously, Gamely and Princess Nesian, and Gamely is the winner by half length. Princess Nesian second with Desert Law finishing. Gamely and her regular writer Wayne Harris were also successful against outstanding males in 1968. And there they go. Rising market is going to the front in Dulto. His second Gamely, third on the rail deck, and fourth. Hillshine is fifth on the outside. Uh, most host is sixth. Then Rivet, Zulu Lad, O'Hara, Lucky Bush, Proud Land and Jungle Road. It's Rising Market in front on the outside by a neck. Deckhand is second by a half length. Gamely third by a neck. In Dulto fourth racing on the extreme outside. Most host is fifth. Hillshine sixth. And Rivet turning for home. It's Rising Market in front on the inside. Uh, 
by a head in due toe. His second by a head, game lead. Third moving up between horses by two and a half lengths. Most host is fourth on the extreme outside and he'll sign. The end of the stretch, it's game lead. In front on the outside by a head, rising market is second by a one length. Rivet third on the inside and he'll sign. Game lead on the outside and rising market head and head. Game lead and rising market nose and nose. And game lead is the winner by a nose, rising market second. With his for the Gold Cup, Maloney saddled Princess Nesian and Gamely for Bill Perry against the very best. Jim Maloney told jockey Donald Pierce to save as much ground as he could on Princess Nesian because he felt she would be best at the distance. Fortunately for Pierce, an opening along the rail developed at just the right moment. Racing room in front, Princess Legion. Racing room in Princess Legion, nose and nose. And Princess Legion is the winner by a head. Racing room second with quick and three. Coming up on the rail to be third. In more than half a century, only three mares have won the Gold Cup. Happy Issue in 1944, Tuli in 1952, and Princess Legion in 1968. 1968 also featured the return of John Nerud. For the Californian, he brought a colt called rank, arrogant, conceited, impetuous, and headstrong. Dr. Fager was not at all like the man he was named for, Dr. Charles Fager, who had saved Nerud's life with two brain operations after the trainer fell from a pony at Belmont Park. His Hall of Fame jockey, Raulio Baeza, took care not to antagonize his mouth, but Dr. Fager could barely tolerate being rated. And there they go. Dr. Roy E. is going to the front. Kiss and George is second, moving up on the inside. Dr. Fager, third on the outside. Rising Market is fourth. Barb's Delight, fifth. Field Master, sixth. Then Sand Devil, our Michael, around the turn. It's Kiss and George in front, drawing out to buy two lengths. Rising Market. No horse had won this race under 130 pounds, but that was the way to sign Dr. Fager who proved just how headstrong he could be. Yeah, there goes Dr. Fager moving up on the inside. It's still kissing George in front on the outside by a neck. Dr. Fager is second on the rail by a length and a half. Rising market third by a neck. Dr. Roy E fourth by four lengths. Barb's Delight fifth and gamely turning into the stretch. It's Dr. Fager in front by three quarters of a length. Kiss and George is second by one length. Barb's Delight third. Gamely is fourth. And Rising Market really is pulled up. It's Dr. Fager in front by two and a half lengths. Gamely is second. Rising Market third. And Barb's Delight. Dr. Fager in front. Gamely and Rising Market. And Dr. Fager is the winner by three lengths. Gamely second by a length with Rising Market. Finishing third. Dr. Fager was voted Horse of the Year. 1968 and into the Hall of Fame in 1971. His stablemate, Secretariat, would be Horse of the Year in 1972, but Reva Ridge was the favorite of owner Penny Tweedy that summer. Trained by Hall of Fame conditioner Lucien Lauren, Reva Ridge was shipped west for the Hollywood Derby, and John Forsyth conducted a stable interview of his connections. The owner, but the breeder, too, of Reva Ridge. And uh, as a yearling, he was a little on the scrawny side, and you didn't have such high hopes for him, did you? No, we really didn't. He was kind of a sleeper. He w he'd been sick when he shipped home from Kentucky, and he didn't carry much flesh, and with those floppy ears, he did... He had a racy quality, but he wasn't very prepossessing, so he's a pleasant surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't somebody say that the more wins he has, the better looking he gets, too? <laughs> By all means. <laughs> <laughs> Lucian, do you think uh, he had his first blowout here on the track this morning? Uh, you, you think he's going to like this kind of a strip? Well, I certainly hope so. It's a long way to come down here if he doesn't run good. <laughs> <laughs> I think he will like it. I think he'll run very well. He seems to run good every place he goes to. He's been to many different racetracks so far, part of the country. And as you can see by the racing form, and that uh, he made a good account of himself. Although he had won the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont Stakes, Reva Ridge had to run every step of the way in the West. Final 
Best uh, is second on the outside by a neck royal champion. Third, Vicker is fourth on the inside. And Quack moving up on the extreme outside. Now it's final Esta on the outside by a head. Reva Ridge is second. Vicker and Quack. Reva Ridge in front on the rail. Reva Ridge, final Esta and Vicker. Reva Ridge in front and Vicker. And Reva Ridge is the winner by a neck. Vicker second by a neck with final Esta finishing third. Another famous woman owner had taken center stage in 1971. Academy Award winning actress Greer Garson and her husband Buddy Fogelson purchased Ack Ack that year from Harry Guggenheim. Greer expressed definite feelings about owning such an animal. We feel that a great horse is a, a natural phenomenon and nobody really owns a noble creature like Ack Ack. You can't own him any more than you can own a, a thunderstorm or a mountain or a river. It's more like a trust. It's been our happy privilege to be his custodians and together with his great trainer, Charlie Whittingham, and his superb rider, Willie Shoemaker, we've tried to help him realize his greatest potential. Live up to his potential he did. He never lost a race for the Fogelsons. And Master Hand around the turn. It's Emma Mia in front of the inside by a head. Galea Pass is second by a length and a half. Akak -Ak third by a neck pitch in wedge. In the express handicap, Akak -Ak seemed blocked behind two speed horses when Shoemaker spotted an opening. By a head, Galea Pass is second by one length. Here comes Akak -Ak through between horses. Now it's Akak -Ak in front. Galea Pass is second. Emma Mia pitching wedge and Earl of Mildale. Akak -Ak in front drawing out. Galea Pass and pitching wedge. And Akak -Ak is the winner by three lengths. Pitching in his only start on the grass, Akak -Ak picked up 130 pounds and set a new course record in a manner that suggested a gallop in the park more than a contest. To entice other horsemen to run against him, they threw a breakfast party for Gold Cup entrance and assigned Akak -Ak an unbelievable 134 pounds. They even asked Charlie Whittingham to assist in the pull for post. Advanced guard is six. It was the race that made him horse of the year and would put him into the Hall of Fame. There they go. Akai is going to the front. Manta is second. A judgeable third moving up on the inside. Figanero fourth. Gamtal is fifth. Razor Dancer sixth. Then Duncan and the field. Around the first turn, it's Akak in front, drawing out by a length and a half. Judgeable is second by three lengths. Piganetto third by a length. Manta fourth by two lengths. Duncan is fifth. Comtal sixth. Then the field and raise it and serve. It's Akak. Winning on the lead all the way is winning the hard way. But there he was in glorious isolation, running the classic American distance with more weight than any horse had ever carried in the history of the Hollywood Gold Cup and doing it with style. Three and a half lengths, Viganetto is second by a length and a half. Manta, third on the outside. Judgeable is fourth and Comtal. Into the stretch, it's Hack Hack in front by three and a half lengths. Viganetto is second by one length. Manta, third by a head. Comtal, fourth in the field. Hack Hack in front, Comtal is second on the outside. Manta, third and Viganetto. Hack Hack in front, Comtal and Manta. Hack Hack was the only horse ever to win both the five five and one half furlong express handicap and mile and one quarter gold cup in the same year. He won three Eclipse awards, also one for his owners and one for his trainer, Charlie Whittingham. A big, rough Chilean bred, Cougar II was more of a training challenge for Whittingham. He was a grass hopeful when he came into Charlie's barn and made his first big main track score in the 1971 California. And here comes Cougar, the field, into the stretch, it's Master Hand in front by three lengths. 
Cougar is second, moving up on the outside very strongly. Good Manners is third, and judgeable on the inside of Creature Price. Master Hand, and here comes Cougar on the rail. Cougar on the inside, Master Hand and Creature Price. Cougar in front, drawing out, and Cougar is the winner by a lake. Master Hand second by three. Bought by Mary Bradley when he was four, Cougar was honest, consistent, exciting, and a favorite of the crowd. In this Hollywood Invitational, he conceded two pounds to Fort Marcy and was about ten lengths behind that champion in the stretch. Turning into the stretch, it's divide and rule in front by a length and a half. Fort Marcy is second by three lengths. Cougar is third, drum top fourth on the rail in the field. Now it's Fort Marcy in front of the outside and divide and rule. And here comes Cougar on the rail, a driving finish. Fort Marcy and Cougar, Cougar on the inside and Fort Marcy, Cougar in front, and Cougar is the winner by a neck, Fort Marcy second, by a length and a half. Whether ridden by Donald Pierce, Lafitte Pinkai, or his regular jockey, Bill Shoemaker, Cougar was tough to handle. His late running style made traffic problems inevitable. When Shoemaker let him lag far behind in the early part of the 1973 Invitational, they ran into interference, and under 130 pounds, his late rally was not enough to catch Life Cycle and Pinkai. Pinkai had ridden Cougar to victory in the 1973 Santa Anita Handicap, so Mary Bradley decided that he would replace Shoemaker in the upcoming Gold Cup. Perhaps the press made more of the incident than was necessary. The resulting public interest made the 1973 Gold Cup a special race, since Shoemaker had picked up the mount on another Whittingham-trained horse, Kennedy Road. The paddock was full of sound and color in support of Shoemaker, while Whittingham, with a three-horse entry, seemed to be in the catbird seat. There they go. Kennedy Road is going to the front. Briartic is second. Queen's Hustler third. Quack is fourth. Alex Strano fifth and Cougar Trails. Coming by the stands, it's Briartic in front on the inside by a half length. Kennedy Road is second by three lengths. Quack third by a half length. Queen's Hustler fourth by a length and a half. Alex Strano is fifth and Cougar. Going to turn, it's Briartic in front by three quarters of a length. Kennedy Road is second by a neck quack. Third moving up on the outside by four lengths. The Queen's Hustler is fourth. Then Alex Strano and Cougar into the stretch. It's Briartic in front on the inside by a half length. Kennedy Road is second by a head quack. Third racing on the extreme outside by four lengths. Queen's Hustler and Cougar. Now it's quack in front on the outside by a neck. Kennedy Road is second, Briartic third, here comes Cougar on the rail, Quack on the outside, and Kennedy Road in there, head and head, Quack and Kennedy Road, head and head, nose and nose, and Kennedy Road is the winner by a nose, Quack second by three with Cougar. Finishing Whittingham saddled first, second, and third, something unique in Gold Cup history, and Shoemaker seemed to relish having risen to the occasion once again. Mary Bradley, to prove all was forgiven, returned Shoemaker to the saddle for Cougar's next race, the Sunset Handicap, and the reunited team was immortalized by a poster. The public was enchanted. Like a vein of gold, the career of Bill Shoemaker runs through Hollywood Park history. The Ellsworth champions, Whittingham and Liz Whitney Tippett, milestones marked in the Hollywood style, consistent brilliance in riding, in winning more races, more stakes than any other jockey, Hollywood Park was the main arena for Shoemaker's unmatched skills. In June of 1970, he won six races on a single card for the second time. The only other rider to have had one such day at Hollywood Park is Lafitte Pinkai. Few athletes ever enjoyed the respect and affection accorded Shoemaker from the public and his peers during an incomparable career. 
Second only to Shoemaker in the National and Hollywood Park record books, Lafitte Pinkai has been honored by five Eclipse Awards, more than any other writer. His mount, Susan's Girl, won the coveted Eclipse Trophy for a record three years. Bred and owned by Fred Hooper, Susan's Girl was voted into the Hall of Fame in 1976. Lafitte Pinkai Jr., brought to this country from his native Panama by Mr. Hooper, received that honor in 1975. Ancient title was the Pinkai Mount for the 1975 California, and they were all out at the finish. Battle between horses by ahead. Big Band is second and now taking the lead on the outside is Big Band in front. Ancient title is second and centuries on, boy. Big Band and Ancient title are head and head. Ancient title in front again. Ancient title and Big Band and Ancient title is winner by ahead. Big Band second by three. Pink Kai calls this the best horse he's ever ridden. No horse ever finished in front of affirmed with Pink Kai in the saddle. The 1977 juvenile marked their debut at Hollywood Park. In four lifetime starts here, Affirmed won them all. Rising Echo, third by ahead, Metal Bender is fourth. Morning Blast and he sips Fables. Now it's Affirmed in front by four lengths. His trainer, Lazaro Barrera, made the Hall of Fame in 1979. That same year, Affirmed carried 132 pounds in the Hollywood Gold Cup. Affirmed in front by half length. Sir Lad is second and text. Affirmed drawing out. Affirmed and Sir Lad and text. And affirmed is the winner by half length. Sir Lad second by three and a half. On his way to a repeat as Horse of the Year and then into Racing's Hall of Fame in 1980. photographs of their favorite athletes and with temporary access to the saddling paddock the faithful made each autograph day memorable the payoff seemed precious in these surroundings for season after season this has been the domain of great horses and horsemen In 1975, a young rider made his first appearance here for the all-star jockey race. Within three years, Chris McCarron had moved west and become a major figure. McCarron demonstrated his judgment and skill aboard John Henry in the 1984 Hollywood Turf Invitational. Going to the front, then John Henry along the rail races second. On the outside, Decca Drockham settles into third with movable feast fourth. Galaver races fifth. And as load the cannons, Jenkins Ferry. The final two are Victory Zone and Sir Pele. They go into the far turn for the first time. A tightly bunched field. Lucent leads the way by a little more than a length. Decca Drockham on the outside has a head into second. John Henry at the rail is third by two. Galaver races fourth by a length. Then as load the cannons, followed by Movable Feast, Victory Zone, and Sir Pele. Around the far turn, Lucens continues to lead by a half length. Decca Drockham races second by head. Load the cannons, moves up on the outside, and it's John Henry still saving ground at the rail. Followed by Galaver in victory zone. They're at the top of the stretch. Lucens with a short lead. And it's load the cannons. Galaver on the outside. John Henry moving between horses. With an eighth of a mile to go, there's four horses battling for the lead. Here comes John Henry moving along the rail, and Galaver on the outside. Galaver on the outside. John Henry on the inside. John Henry with a short lead. And John Henry does it again. Racetracks are literally places where dreams do come true. For Chris McCarran, a trip to the Hall of Fame in 1989 after only 14 years as a jockey. For trainer Ron McAnally, raised in a Kentucky orphanage, membership in that exclusive club in 1990. He had taken a gelding which no one seemed to want and made him into the most valuable one-horse stable in history for Sam and Dorothy Rubin. John Henry, the six and a half million dollar dream with this game victory became the first nine-year-old ever to win a grade one event. 
He joined his trainer in the Hall of Fame in 1990. Hollywood Park started in 1938 as a place of beauty and fun. It has evolved into much more. Year by year, these stands have witnessed great and thrilling moments. Remarkable careers beginning and honorable careers ending. Talented horsemen spending a lifetime perfecting their trade. A special few awarded the ultimate accolade, acceptance into the Hall of Fame. Hollywood Park has provided a fitting stage for great events for more than 50 years. A remarkable thoroughbred heritage has been celebrated here. Now, vigorous and forceful management with the will and resources to move with the times can discover new heroes to build on the cherished past for a bright and exciting future.